Good morning, students. Our today's session is on the anatomy of nose and paranasal sinuses, part second. Anatomy of nose and paranasal sinuses, part second. Learning objectives for my today's class are at the end of this session, students should be able to define and enumerate paranasal sinuses, describe anatomy of each sinus, explain pathological involvement of these sinuses on anatomical basis. They should be able to identify various paranasal sinuses on X-ray and CT scan. They should be able to explain anatomical basis of various surgical procedures. Last but not the least, MCQs at the end of this session will test knowledge of students besides there are some slides to cover practical part of this session. Paranasal sinuses are air containing bony spaces present around the nasal cavity. They are lined by respiratory mucous membrane. There are four paired paranasal air sinuses. Names of these sinuses are derived from the bone in which they are contained. For example, maxillary air sinus lies within the body of the maxilla. Frontal air sinuses, they lie within the frontal bone. Ethymoidal ear sinuses lie within the ethymoid and saphenoidal ear sinus lies within the body of saphenoid as shown in this figure. Clinically, these sinuses are classified into two groups, anterior group which includes frontal, anterior ethmoidal and maxillary ear sinus. Posterior group includes posterior ethmoidal and saphenoidal ear sinus. Frontal ear sinus is contained within the frontal bone. Ethymoidal ear sinus are contained within the ethmoidal bone. Maxillary ear sinus are contained within the maxilla and saphenoidal ear sinuses are contained within the body of saphenoid as shown in this figure. What are the functions of these ear sinuses? Functions of the paranasal ear sinuses are humidifying and warming of inspired air by providing large surface area of contact. They make the skull lighter. These sinuses add resonance to the sound. They act as thermal insulators to protect the delicate structures in the orbit and cranium. They also act as shock absorbers. These sinuses also contribute to the growth of facial skeleton as the age advances towards puberty. Development of paranasal sinuses. Paranasal sinuses develop as outpouchings from the mucous membrane of the lateral wall of nose. Therefore, they are ectodermal in origin. At birth, only maxillary and ethmoidal sinuses are present. Growth of sinuses continues during childhood and early adult life. Radiologically, maxillary sinuses are rudimentary at birth, can be identified at about four to five months of age. First protein growth occurs at about six to seven years, and maxillary sinus is fully developed at puberty. Frontal sinus is absent at the birth. It starts developing at two to three years after birth and can be identified radiologically at six years of age. Ethymoidal is identified radiologically at one year and saphenoidal at four years of age. Mucous membrane of these sinus. Paranasal sinuses are lined by mucous membrane, which is continuous with that of nasal cavity through ostia of these sinuses. Mucous membrane is thinner and less vascular as compared to that of the nasal cavity. It is ciliated columnar epithelium with goblet cells which secrete mucus. Cilia are marked near the ostia of the sinuses and help in the mucus drainage towards the nasal cavity. Ventilation of these sinuses. Ventilation takes place through their ostia. During inaspiration, air current causes negative pressure in the nose. This varies from six millimeters to 200 millimeters of water depending on the force of inspiration. During expiration, positive pressure is created in the nose and sets of eddy currents which ventilate the sinuses. So sinuses are aerated during expiration, not during inspiration. Thus, ventilation of the sinuses is paradoxical. Air leaves during inspiration and fills these sinuses during expiration. This is just reverse what happens in lungs which fill during inspiration and empty during expiration. Lymphatic drainage of paranasal air sinus. Lymphaticus form a capillary network in their lining mucosa. They drain into lateral retropharyngeal 
and or jugulodigastric group of lymph nodes. Maxillary sinus. It is a pneumatic space lodged in the body of maxilla that communicates with the external environment by way of middle mat. It is also known as antrum of eye mode. Maxillary sinuses are the largest paranasal sinuses. Their height is 3.5 cm and their width is 2.5 5 to 3 centimeters. Average capacity of maxillary sinus is 15 ml. These sinuses lie within the body of the maxilla above the upper teeth. Maxillary sinuses are paired but asymmetric. Both maxillary sinuses open in the middle meatus of the nose. Maxillary sinuses are pyramidal in shape with base directed towards the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. It has an apex which is directed laterally into the zygomatic bone. Roof of the maxillary sinus is formed by floor of the orbit. So roof separates maxillary sinus from orbit. Infraorbital nerves pass through the bony canal in the roof of the sinus. As shown in this figure, infraorbital nerve passes through the roof of maxillary sinus which forms the floor of orbit. Floor of the maxillary sinus is formed by the alveolar and palatine process of maxilla. It is located 1 cm below the floor of the nasal cavity. Ostium of the maxillary sinus is high up in its medial wall and opens into middle meatus. As already said, accessory ostium is present in 30% of individuals and is situated posterior to the main opening. Maxillary sinus is known for its non-dependent drainage as the opening lies at a higher level than the floor of the maxillary sinus. This leads to stagnation of the mucus and other secretions, loss of cilia, stasis and infection. And the infection of the maxillary sinus is called maxillary sinusitis. In fact, maxillary sinus is the commonest sinus involved in sinusitis. Roots of upper molar and premolar almost project into the floor of the maxillary sinus. So extraction may lead to a communication between maxillary sinus and oral cavity. For the same reason, infection from the caries teeth is the common cause of maxillary sinusitis. Base of the maxillary sinus is formed by the lateral wall of nasal cavity. The superior part of the base presents opening of the sinus into hiatus semilunaris of the middle meatus. As already said, maxillary sinus has got non-dependent drainage. Accumulation of the secretions leads to stasis of this fluid which in turn leads to infection and sinusitis. A surgical procedure called enteral puncture is done to take out the secretions from maxillary sinus. Arterial supply of the maxillary sinus. It is supplied by the greater palatine arteries, infraorbital artery and also by the facial artery. Innervation of the sinus. The sinus is innervated by the infraorbital nerve which lies in the roof of the sinus and leaves through the infraorbital foramen. It is also supplied by anterior superior alveolar nerve which runs in the canal in its anterior wall. The posterior wall is penetrated by posterior superior alveolar nerve. The pain due to maxillary sinusitis is referred to the upper teeth and face. The same nerve supplies the mucous membrane of the sinus. As shown in this diagram, it is supplied by the infraorbital nerve, anterior superior alveolar nerve and also by the posterior superior alveolar nerves. Now the question is why maxillary sinus is commonest sinus involved in sinusitis. As already said, the sinus has got non-dependent drainage. Floor of the sinus, that means floor of the sinus lies at a lower level than it is ostium or opening. This leads to stasis which leads to loss of cilia due to infection. Inflammation of mucosa is called sinusitis. Let us go to a CT scan of this sinus. As shown in this figure, let us read a CT scan of this sinus. MS represents the right maxillary sinus. CT scan of the maxillary sinus. On the right side, this arrow shows normal maxillary sinus which appears translucent while as the left maxillary sinus appears opaque. Pasty means there is some pathology in the left maxillary sinus. This pathology may be due to infection and edema which appears as an opacity on the while doing CT of this sinus. So N represents the normal sinus while O represents opacity. As already said opacity can be due to infection or edema. Now what is intranasal androstomy? Intranasal androstomy it is a surgical procedure. In this procedure, an opening is made in the lateral wall of the nose below the inferior meters close to the floor of the maxillary sinus. And it facilitates drainage of this sinus whenever it is natural opening is blocked. This procedure may injure the nasolacrimal duct. As shown in this figure, 
these red dotted areas represent the collection of infected fluid with the maxillary sign. We pass a cannula below the inferior turbinate through the lateral wall of the nose which forms the medial wall of the sinus to drain out the fluid as shown in this animation. I repeat, so these red lines represent the infected fluid inside the maxillary sinus which is locked there due to the obstruction of its natural ostium. We pass a cannula deep to the inferior turbinate to the lateral wall of the nose to enter the maxillary sinus to drain out the secretion. This procedure is called intranasal prostum. Frontal sinus, as already said, it lies in the frontal bone. It is situated between the inner and outer tables of the frontal bone above and deep to the supraorbital margin. Right and left sinuses are asymmetrical because the septum between the two is obliquely placed. In fact, none of the parasitical sinuses are symmetrical. As the septum between them is obliquely placed, so the two sinuses or not mirror image of each other, they are not of equal size. Frontal sinus opens into the middle matrix of the nose. The relations of the frontal sinus are anterior wall is related to the skin of the forehead, posterior wall is related to the meninges and frontal lobe of the brain, inferior wall is related to the roof of orbit and ethmoidal air cells. Frontal sinus drains into middle matrix of the nose through frontonasal duct which begins in the floor of the sinus. Mucous membrane of the sinus is supplied by the supraorbital nerve which is a branch of frontal nerve. In this animation you can see how frontal sinus drainage into middle meters of the nose through frontonasal duct. What is frontal sinusitis? Frontal sinusitis is the inflammation of the mucosa of the frontal sinus. It presents with pain and tenderness in the region of forehead also gives early morning headache which is relieved as the day passes. Sinus tenderness may be present on clinical examination of frontal sinus. Ethmoidal ear sinus. Ethmoidal ear sinuses are thin walled ear cells in the labyrinth of ethmoid. They are 15 to 18 in number. These ear cells are located between the upper lateral wall of nasal cavity and medial wall of the orbit. They are divided into three groups. Anterior group opens into anterior part of the infantibulum of the middle meatus. Middle group projects into the middle meatus, producing ethmoidal bulla, and this group opens on the summit of the bulla. Posterior group opens into superior meatus of the nose. Innervation of ethmoidal ear cells. Ethmoidal nerves branches from nasociliary nerve and also by orbital branches of the maxillary nerve supply mucous membrane of ethmoidal ear cells. Clinical correlation of ethmoidal ear cells. As shown in this diagram, the lateral wall of the ethmoidal sinus is formed by the paper-like lamina of bone called lamina papyracea. It is extremely fragile, hence slightest injury to it can lead to spread of ethmoidal infection to the orbit as shown in this diagram. Siphonoidal ear cells. Again, a pair of siphonoidal ear cells is located in the body of the siphonoid. As shown in the figure, the right and the left septonodal air sinuses are separated by a septum which is deflected. It is not symmetrical. So again, the size of right and left septonodal air cells is not same. Thus, the two sinuses are asymmetrical. Each sinus opens into the siphonoidal recess by an opening situated in the upper part of the lateral wall of the nose. In this diagram, siphonidal ear sinus filled with secretion is shown by the yellow rounded animation drainage in siphonoethmoidal recess. Siphonidal ear sinus, as already said, lies within the body of the siphonite. It is above it lies pituitary gland in, and optic chiasma. Pituitary gland lies in sila tersica or pituitary fossa. Below the siphonidal ear sinuses lies nasal cavity. Anteriorly lies siphonoethmoidal recess of the lateral wall of nasal cavity into which opens the siphonidal ear sinuses. On either side of siphonidal ear sinus or laterally lies cavernous sinus and it is closed neurovascular relations as shown in this figure. So siphonidal ear sinus demarcated by SS, pituitary fossa, on either side of these siphonidal ear sinuses lies cavernous sinus with its associated structures. Innervation of siphonidal sinus. If siphonidal sinus are innervated by the posterior ethmoidal nerve and also orbital branch of maxillary nerve supply it is mucous membrane. Surgical approach to the siphonidal sinus is very important clinically. 
as pituitary gland is related to the roof of the saponidal sinus. This relation is used to approach the gland by surgeons. A procedure called tronus surgical approach to the saponidal ear sinus as pituitary gland is related to the roof of the saponidal ear sinus. The re this relation is used to approach the gland. A procedure called tronus nasal tronus saponoidal hypophysectomy. In this procedure, nucoperiosteum of the nasal septum is elevated on both sides to reach the saponoid bone via roof of the nasal cavity. The anterior wall of the sinus is opened and its septum is removed. After this, an incision is given in the roof of the sinus to approach the pituitary gland which lies in the sila tersica. As shown in this figure, pituitary gland is demarcated by this red encircled area and adenoma is demarcated by this greenish encircled area. Both of them lie in pituitary fossa. Below the pituitary fossa is body of the saphenoid containing saphenoidal ear sinus. In order to remove the pituitary adenoma, an approach called tronus nasal tronus saphenoidal approach is done where we reach the body of the saphenoid through the nasal cavity, puncture the anterior wall of the sinus, puncture the bone between the pituitary fossa and the sinus and take out the adenoma. This procedure is called tronus nasal tronus saphenoidal approach for removal of pituitary adenoma as shown in this diagram. Now let us see these, how these paranasal sinuses look if we take a lateral x-ray of skull. In this x-ray we can see the frontal sinus which lies between the inner and outer table of the skull, maxillary sinus which lies within the body of maxilla, then ethmoidal ear cells which are divided into anterior, middle and posterior groups and saphenoidal ear cell which lies within the body of the saphenoid and above the body of the saphenoid there is sila tersica or pituitary fossa which lodges the pituitary gland. An anterior posterior view of the skull again we can see frontal ear sinus within the frontal bone, maxillary ear sinus within the body of maxilla and ethmoidal ear cell. I want to summarize my lecture as under paranasal sinuses or pneumatic spaces surrounding nose. These sinuses act as passage for air and are aerated during expiration in contrast to the lungs which get aerated during inspiration. They cause lightening of skull, warming and humidifying air, thus conditioning of inspired air. Maxillary sinus is the largest and commonly involved in sinusitis. All sinus discharge their secretions into nasal cavity. Blockade of the sinuses causes damage to the cilia, stasis, infection and sinusitis. Sinusitis of each sinus has typical presentations which can be diagnosed clinically or by radiological examination. Anatomical knowledge guides surgical approach to various sinuses. Now let us go for a quiz based on this lecture. In this quiz, you will be provided an MCQ with four options. You have to choose the most accurate one. Our first question is, which of the following is not true about functions of nose and paranasal sinuses? A. They act as passage of the air. B. Nose performs the function of smell. C. Paranasal sinuses are aerated during inspiration. D. Paranasal sinuses humidify air, they also warm the inspired air. Choice C is wrong. Paranasal sinuses are aerated during inspiration. The cor correct answer is they are aerated during expiration. Which of the following is not a feature of a beautiful nose? A. Size of the nose should be proportionate to the size of the face. B. Length of the nose should be one third of the distance from hairline to chin. C. Breadth of the nose should be one fifth of the breadth of face. D. Nasal labial angle in males is 115 degrees. D is the wrong option. Nasal labial angle in males is 90 degrees, not 115. Which of the following structures opens into inferior meatus of the nose? Saphenoidal ear sinus. B. Ethmoidal ear sinus. C. Maxillary ear sinus. D. Nasal lacrimal duct. Is the nasal lacrimal duct which opens into inferior meatus of the nose. Which of the following paranasal sinuses is commonly involved in sinusitis? A. Siphonidal, B. Ethmoidal, C. Maxillary, D. Frontal. So it is the maxillary sinus which is commonly involved in sinusitis because of its non dependent drainage. Which is the largest paranasal ear sinus? A. Siphonidal, B. Ethmoidal, C. Maxillary, D. Frontal. Again, maxillary sinus is the largest paranasal ear sinus. This volume is about 15 ml. 
Our next question is the number of ethmoidal ear cells is 5 to 10, B is 8 to 12, C is 10 to 14, D is 15 to 18. D is the correct option. The paranasal sinus, which appears first of all on radiological examination, is cephanoidal, ethmoidal, maxillary, frontal. The correct option is maxillary sinus, appears first of all on radiological examination. Early morning frontal headache is seen in sinusoids of which sinus? Maxillary, B frontal, C ethmoidal, D siphonoidal. The correct answer is frontal. Which of the following vessel is called coronary artery of the nose? A septal branch of the superior labial, B anterior ethmoidal artery, C posterior ethmoidal artery, D greater palatine artery. The correct option is A septal branch of superior labial is artery is called coronary artery of nose. Now let us check whether we can read this x-ray or not. Identify the sinuses labeled in this x-ray. A. It represents maxillary sinus. B. Represents frontal sinus. C. Represents ethmoidal ear cells. C. Represents ethmoidal ear cells. D. Represents, represents siphonoidal ear sinus. E. Represents sila tergica which lodges the pituitary gland. It is also called the pituitary fossa. Our next question is identify the structures labeled as A. A represents maxillary sinus. B. B represents frontal sinus. C. Represents orbit. D. D represents right nasal cavity. This is basically an anterior posterior x ray of the skull, and the previous one was lateral x-ray of the skull. Let us go to this clinical problem. A patient presents with early morning frontal headache. Which sinus is involved? Maxillary, frontal, ethmoidal, siphonoidal. The correct answer is frontal ear sinus. Identify various labeled structures in this wet specimen. A. A is body of the siphonoid and within the body of siphonoid there is siphonoidal ear sinus. B. B represents the superior turbinate or superior conga. C represents the inferior meatus of the nose in which opens the nasolacrimal duct. D represents the middle turbinate. Below the middle turbinate is middle meatus of the nose in which opens frontal, maxillary, anterior and middle ethmoidal ear sinuses. P represents pituitary gland which is present in the pituitary fossa or sila tersica, nasopharyngeal opening of the stachian tube. Q represents uvula. D represents the nasal bone. V represents vestibule of the nasal cavity. M represents the middle meatus of the nose. H represents pod palate, which forms the roof of the oral cavity and floor of the nasal cavity. We can say this pod palate separates nasal cavity from the oral cavity. Do not forget to like, subscribe, and share this video. Thank you for watching this video.